Thank you very much, Chris. Unfortunately, I can't dance very well, so I, I, won't, I won't embarrass you or myself. Um, <laughs> so thank you very much to um, Christine, Patrick, and Anne for the invitation to come and speak to you today. I hope you can all hear me okay from the microphone. Okay, cool. So um, my lab is really interested in deciphering the role of heterogeneity on multiple levels um, in various subtypes of breast cancer. We mainly focus on ILC and triple negative breast cancer in my lab. Um, but today I'm going to talk to you about specifically the heterogeneity we could hear in, in some of our published work and um, quite a bit of unpublished, quite new data that we've, we've got recently. I'm looking at the immune microenvironment, so continuing on, on that theme. And also, um, later on, I'll present some extremely new findings that we've been looking at, looking at the subclonal evolution in um, mouse models of breast cancer. So, yeah. so I'm going to skip most of the intro slides because, um, you know, we've covered all this anyway. But again, just to highlight that ILC is, is a heterogeneous disease um, at the histological level. And um, I've just put pleomorphics up here because this is something that I'm going to talk about a bit later on. Um, you know, we know that pleomorphic ILCs are generally aggressive and they show this nuclear atypia. Um, as, as it's been touched on today, ILC can show heterogeneity in the context of the expression of E. cadherin. And here's an example of one tumour that has a ductal component expressing nice, strong nuclear E. cadherin expression and a lobular component that's completely negative. And these account for around 3 to 5% of all ILCs diagnosed. We've heard a lot about, during the course of this meeting, mutations and the mutational repertoire of both primary and metastatic ILC. And again, just to highlight that the mutational repertoire is quite different. Um, and again, that's in primary and also metastatic ILC. And, you know, we see um, enrichment in mutations such as uh, TBX3, HER2, FOXA1 in metastatic ILC. And as Wilbert pointed out, arid one a yesterday as well. And pleomorphic ILCs are particularly associated with an increased incidence of HER2 genomic alterations. But it's becoming a bit more evident, and this is something that Val's going to talk about in the next talk, that ILCs have a, a unique stromal landscape, which obviously may pay a, play a role in their prognosis and um, therapy response. And this is a paper that came out from the Carlos Caldas Empire um, that was published in Nature a couple of months ago. And essentially, they did high-content high proteomic profiling of a set of primary tumors from the Metabrix study. And they found that um, those patients, tumors that had what they called a vascular stroma, so either this vascular signature or podoplanin-positive signature, uh, was associated with um, patients with e-cadherin mutations. So they didn't actually describe lobular breast cancers, but it was uh, enriched in patients with having an e-cadherin mutation and actually was associated with a good prognosis. So some of these things aren't all bad. And we've heard a lot about today about the immune landscape, so I won't go over that, but just to say, again, that there is some um, evidence that has a prognostic role in ILCs. So in my lab, we're interested in tackling three particular questions, and today I'm going to touch on all of these. And this is some of our published work, as I'm going to talk about first, where we're looking at how ILCs with heterogeneous e cadherin expression harbor unique genomic alterations, and really asking the question, you know, do these differ in, term, in terms of their genomic makeup, and does this explain the heterogeneity? Secondly, I'll talk a bit about the geno genomic and immune features that correlate with, in particular, early relapse in ILC and pleomorphic ILC. And thirdly, I'm going to touch on some of our newest data looking at subclonal heterogeneity and how that may potentially be playing a role in the metastatic progression. So here we've been interested, firstly, looking at reconciling the heterogeneity of e cadherin expression itself in invasive lobular breast cancer. And this is a study that was published recently um, in the special journal that was orchestrated by um, Christine and Anne. And so we were, together with Anne Vincent Solomon at the Curie, we were interested in looking at why tumors with heterogeneous e cadherin expression have uh, differences in, in e cadherin expression. And we know that these mixed ILCs account for 3 to 5% of all ILCs diagnosed. Um, and they can have, as I said at the beginning, a mixed histology. So it can show ductal histology with high levels of e cadherin expression or lobular and a lobular histology in the same tumor. Um, so this can happen. Um, and this is thought to, 
the evolution is thought to occur via a, a DCIS precursor, so a ductal precursor, where they then lose e adherin. But we can see mixed tumors that also have um, ILC histology where we retain e adherin expression or have weak or aberrant cytoplasmic expression of e adherin, juxtaposed next to um, a, lobular, a bona fide lobular breast cancer that has a loss of e adherin expression. So we were particularly interested in studying these types of tumors. And again, asking the question, do these arise from a common ductal ancestor? And can we classify these as being IDC-like or ILC-like? And what are the genomic alterations that are unique between the different components? So, as I said, with, with Anne at the Institute Curie, we collated a series of um, nine patient samples that showed distinct um, components of their tumors that were either e adherin negative or e adherin positive or had this weird cytoplasmic um, weak staining, so we called them aberrant. And we also had the, the germline DNA, so we're able to perform immune histochemistry whole genome sequencing. We did this at quite high depth at 100x coverage. And we did high density methylation arrays as well, at 850k arrays. So this has double the amount of probes onto the array using TCJ. And this is an example of some of the tumors that we, we studied here. So you can see in these three cases, the lobular component has loss of e-cadherin expression. Um, and here we can see in the aberrant component, this, this tumor here has some sort of ductal morphology, but um, has and retains e adherin expression, although it's a bit weak compared to the normal ducts. And here we have a more lobular histology, but with weak um, e adherin protein expression. And this um, patient's tumor here was lobular and had DCIS that we dissected out. And this, in a sense, was our, our positive control, which is bona fide um, ductal, um, ductal carcinoma in situ. Oops. So the first thing we did, or um, Anne did, was to look, look at the protein stains of e adherin and also P120 and beta-catenin. And within the e adherin negative components, as expected, we see um, weak staining of P120 and negativity for beta-catenin in line with what we know about lobular breast cancer and an activation of this pathway. But interestingly, in the e adherin aberrant components of all these tumors, with the exception of the DCIS, we saw the same pattern of staining. So we saw weak P120 catenin expression, and um, they, were ne they were all negative for beta-catenin, with a few dotted around positive nuclei. So this is really suggesting that these, um, this half of the, these tumors actually maybe came from a e adherin negative precursor, and they are act or actually can be classified as lobular-like rather than IDC-like. So we next want to look at the driver mutations that are potentially shared or distinct between both of the components in these patients' tumors. And here I've just shown the uh, driver mutations that are most common in lobular breast cancer. And you can see that within the context of e adherin mutations, five out of nine of our patients had an e adherin mutation. But this was the same mutation present in both components and present at the same frequency as well. Um, so this, this was quite a surprise to us, particularly um, as we expected for some of the, the tumors that we thought there might be differential mutations in e adherin between the different components, as some people have pre previously shown. We did, however, see some differences in other driver mutations, PI3 kinase as an example. So in this patient's tumor here, ML8, we see um, lack of a PI3 kinase mutation in the aberrant component, whereas it's present in the negative component. And again, in this, in this patient's tumor here, in the DCIS, we have a PI3 kinase mutation, but this is actually lost along with a MAP2K4 mutation when it progresses to the lobular breast cancer. So this does then question, particularly in this case, whether the, the lobular, invasive lobular breast cancer was a subclone that did actually derive from the DCIS or not. So we're still unsure about that. But we then went on to look at subclone analysis. And here, instead of looking at the whole tumor, we did this on the, the different dissected components. And we can, oops, sorry, <laughs> skipping ahead too, too far. And what we can see is that, in general, each of the different um, components of these tumors are clonal, so they mainly have one clone. However, in 
And the negative components of ML8, we see two subclones, and this is just plotted out here. So we can see a main clone with the cohering mutation. Apologies, you can't read it, but that's over here. And a, a minor subclone with the PI3 kinase mutation. So altogether, you know, this data suggests that these tumors arise from a common ancestor. And in the context of this patient's tumor here, the aberrant component seems to have come later, given the subclonal frequency of the PR3 kinase mutation. And given that we had whole genome sequencing, we were able to look at the mutational signatures that were in common or different between the two components of these patient's tumors. And this is um, a heat map showing the similarity of, of mutational signatures across that we detected using the whole genome sequencing between the two components. And you can see um, that in the majority of the tumors, apart from this one, ML1, there was a high similarity between the, the signatures identified. And I've just blown up here the signatures for this patient's ML1. And so we see in the negative component an enrichment for Apobex signatures, um, which are C to T um, transitions. And also in the, in the aberrant component, we see more age-related signatures. So this is suggestive that you know, the, this half of... The, the negative components of this tumor has many more mutations than this, the aberrant component. And in fact, when we look at all these the cohering mutant tumors in general, they all have higher enrichment of Apobec signatures. So it might actually be that the Apobec mutator phenotype is more common in tumors with an e-cadherin mutation. And I don't think anyone's really shown, shown this before, and it's something that we can potentially look at in much more detail. And it, you know, there's a thought that this may also be a precursor to the acquisition of, it, of at least some e cohering mutations within these, these patients' tumors. And so given that, you know, around half of our tum tumors lacked an e cohering mutation, we then were, were interested to see whether D pr DNA promoter methylation of e cohering could potentially explain the second mechanism of e cohering um, loss in these, in these tumors. So we performed... Um, DNA methylation arrays, and as I said, these are quite high density, so we could probe across the promoter of e cohering and then really be sure whether there's methylation or not. But in, in agreement with the TCJ data, we didn't identify any e cohering uh, promoter methylation in any of the tumors. Looking at the copy number, um, in this particular case, we did see you know, copy number loss of 16Q and the negative components, whereas we had retention of the the alle both alleles in the aberrant component, which may explain some differences in the e um stain. But for the majority, again, of cases, you know, they, they, they shared the genomic alterations. We did see some promoter methylation of alpha-catenin in, in this case, um, but that was in both components of that tumor, and also a non-coding promoter mutation in alpha-catenin in, in ML3. But again, this patient also had um, an e-cadherin mutation present in both components, so we're not really sure of the, the functionality of those alterations. Um, so we're still, in a, in a sense, when we wrote the paper, unclear perhaps about why the um, aberrant components ha has managed to retain e some sort of e-cadherin expression, even though they seem to have a lobular phenotype. And talking with Mateus, you know, we, we've gone back and done some peak adherent staining on these tumors, and actually they all peak, they're all peak adherent positive. So now, in a sense, we, we are starting to think that these actually are more plastic, and they're actually lobular breast cancers that we've sampled at a particular snapshot in time that have, um, in the, in the what we think is the peak adherent positive or aberrant component, are undergoing this um, e adherent to peak adherent switching but that's yet to be confirmed. So to conclude um, this part, we've shown that the mutation on methylation profiles exhibit similarities between e cohering negative and aberrant positive components suggestive of a common ancestor. And e cohering heterogeneity in these mixed histology tumors is likely to be part of the same spectrum of ILC. And we do have some preliminary evidence for p cohering switching, which kind of begs the question, you know, these are primary breast cancers. Is there some sort of extracellular matrix alterations going on in, in one component versus the other. We do see some heterogeneity in targetable driver alterations, which obviously may have an impact if these patients enter some of these targeted uh, trials. And what I think is quite interesting is that these CDH1 mutant tumors show a higher mutation burden 
in general and enrichment of APOBEC signatures. And I think you know, this is important information, particularly in the UK, we don't use e cadherin or P120 or beta catenin to diagnose lobular breast cancers. And so if a patient turns up with this mixed, mixed histology tumors, it's important to be able to know what they are, and in particularly important to be able to include them in, in ILC-specific trials. And so now, from the other end of our little island, Val Brunton from the University of Edinburgh. See what I did there? He's also going to dance for us. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> okay, thank you, Chris. And also, uh, another thank you to Patrick, Anne and Christine for organising this meeting. It's been great fun and really nice to be back uh, and see people in person. So I'm also going to be talking about tumor microenvironment. So um, we've heard a lot about the molecular and uh, pathological and also clinical differences between um, ILC and uh, NST or IDC. And we're only beginning to really understand what the differences are between the, the tumor microenvironment. We've just heard a nice uh, study there from Rachel about the immune microenvironment. Um, but we don't really know about many of the other um, stromal cells within the microenvironment. So the microenvironment is composed of a lot of uh, non-tumorous uh, stromal cells, including immune cells, but also cancer-associated fibroblasts. We also have a number of matrix proteins within the tumor microenvironment, um, that, such as collagen. And what we know is that in other tumor types, these are very important for regulating uh, tumor behavior. So in terms of the ILC tumor microenvironment, uh, we know that it's very dense uh, tumor microenvironment due to the infiltrative uh, growth pattern of the ILC tumor cells. And there's also been reports of uh, differences in collagen uh, deposition and collagen um, uh, architecture within ILC tumors. Uh, also, re recently, George and Katrin uh, showed very nicely that the ILC tumor cells themselves uh, uh, secrete a unique uh, set of extracellular matrix proteins, and that this actually uh, provided possible uh, therapeutic uh, targets in, in ILC. Uh, we're also going to be hearing uh, later on in the session from Julia, who's got a very nice story uh, using some genetically engineered models of uh, ILC and where she's been profiling the, the cancer-associated fibroblasts. So we are also interested in the cancer-associated fibroblasts. So uh, there's a number of studies that have shown that they have pro-tumorigenic uh, uh, roles. They've also, in some tumors such as pancreatic cancer, they have been shown to have anti-tumorigenic roles. But predominantly, it's pro-tumorigenic roles. So they can, uh, they can secrete a number of growth factors and cytokines that pro uh, provide survival um, advantages uh, to the tumors. And this is just an experiment that we did where we injected uh, tumor cells uh, into mice, and we can look at their growth. Maybe growth in the green, uh, where the tumor cells are injected on their own. And then if we inject them uh, combined with the um, fibroblast shown in here, that you get a very rapid uh, increase in, uh, in the tumor growth uh, in the mice. They also secrete a number of factors that are involved in ECM production uh, and remodeling of the extracellular matrix. And this has been linked to sort of invasion and, and uh, metastatic potential in tumors. And they're also very important, uh, as we've touched on in the last couple of talks, in uh, recruitment and activation of different immune cell populations. So in terms of uh, lobular breast cancer, what we decided to do was we um, wanted to look at uh, the cancer-associated fibroblasts in the lobular tumors. And to do this, what we did was we collected or we isolated cancer-associated fibroblasts from ER-positive ILC tumors and ELP. Uh, ER positive IDC tumors. Uh, we took these tumors, uh, we collected these tumors at the time of uh, surgical resection, and then we isolated them and carried out an RNA seq analysis. 
And this just shows a heat map of the gene changes that we saw in there. So we can see even in this very sort of limited number of uh, cancer-associated fibroblasts, there are specific gene changes associated with the ILC-derived calves and the IDC calves. Uh, and this is work that Esme carried out. And when she did some gene set enrichment analysis, we can see here, for example, that uh, genes associated MIC target genes and also the mTORC signaling are upregulated in the ILC tumors. Whereas uh, in the, I, uh, the calves from the IDC tumors, we can see uh, changes in uh, enrichment in genes associated with TNF alpha signaling and hypoxia. So, suggesting that there are functional differences in the calf populations in the two different tumor types. So obviously this needs a lot more uh, work done and actually um, Anne and colleagues in uh, Paris are now looking at heterogeneity within the different uh, calf uh, subtypes uh, within ILC tumors. So that's going to be really interesting to see, to see how that progresses because there's a lot of evidence suggesting that, the different, that there are different calf subtypes within tumors that have different functional roles. So one of the main uh, functions of CAFs is to act as to facilitate, par facilitate paracrine signaling um, in tumor cells themselves. And they do this through secretion of a number of growth factors and cytokines. Uh, so we carried out an experiment where we collected the conditioned medium from uh, the, our cancer-associated fibroblasts. And so this conditioned medium uh, contains all the secreted factors and then when we added this to our ILC uh, tumor cells, this is the SUM44, uh, and we looked at what signaling changes were happening in the cells. So this is a, a reverse phase protein array, which, and that allows us to profile around about 170 different signaling proteins. And this just shows a heat map of the, of the proteins where you had a differential um, regulation of phosphorylation or, or, or expression of, of these signaling proteins. This is some of the data here showing the most, uh, most, most uh, significant changes. And what we saw was that there was changes in STAT3 signaling or STAT signaling and also uh, changes in signaling pathways related to ERK uh, or GNK signaling. And interestingly, when we went back and uh, looked at this in the RPPA data from the TCGA, we saw that all these signaling pathways were actually increased uh, also in uh, uh, ER-positive ILC tumors compared to the ER-positive ER IDC tumors, suggesting that these pathways may be uh, more activated in the ILC tumors. So... Um, so what we were, we were particularly interested in um, uh, the STAT3 signaling pathway. So STAT3 is a transcription factor and it's been shown to have uh, a number of important roles uh, in, in breast cancer and uh, in, in, in other breast cancer types. There's a lot of studies out there showing that it plays important pro-tumorigenic uh, roles. So one of the main cytokines that is in, involved in uh, upregulating this STAT3 phosphorylation is a cytokine called IL-6. So we wanted to look at the IL-6 STAT3 signaling pathway in our, in our ILC models. So we confirmed that the IL-6 was being secreted by the calves. This is just an ELISA here showing secretion into the, of the protein into the conditioned medium. And then what we did was we took the conditioned medium or recombinant IL-6 and we stimulated the, the SUM44 PE cells with this. And we can see here that if we stimulate with either the uh, recombinant IL-6, you can see a nice phosphorylation of the STAT-3, uh, and also with two different uh, condition region from two different calves, we can see a nice uh, increase in phosphorylation. And importantly, when we pre-treated with an antibody that blocks the function of IL-6, we can completely um, uh, block this, this phosphorylation. So we think that this, uh, this uh, one of the main factors in the conditioned medium from the calves is secretion of this IL-6, which is activating this STAT3 signaling pathway. We also saw some, some effects on, er on ERK signaling as well. So we had a partial reduction in signaling when we, when we treated with the IL-6 uh, antibody. So 
Uh, Esme then went back to look at what was happening in the TCA data set, so she found that the IL-6 uh, mRNA was increased in uh, ILC tumors compared to IDC tumors. And then she looked at the RPPA data set, and, uh, and what she saw there that was there's an increase in phosphorylation of STAT3 in the ILC tumors, and there was a nice correlation between the two uh, in, the ILC, uh, in the ILC tumors, suggesting that this pathway that this IL-6 STAT3 signaling access is, is active in, in these tumours. Uh, so, IL-6 obviously is a stromal factor, and we know that the stromal uh, content of ILC tumours is higher than IDCs. So we wanted to look at this in a little bit more detail. So she used uh, two um, independent algorithms, EDEC and Estimate, that um, estimate the stromal content of uh, tumours from bulk uh, RNA um, expression data sets uh, based on the gene expression and we can see that these both showed an increase in uh, stromal content uh, in the ILC tumours as we would expect and actually what you see is a, a very nice correlation between IL-6 expression uh, and stromal content uh, and we see this both in the IDC tumours and, uh, and in the ILC tumours. We also saw a strong correlate or a correlation with STAT3, and the reason for this is that we know that there's a positive feedback loop, whereas the IL-6 STAT3 signaling pathway acts to, acts, actually acts to um, increase expression of STAT3 itself. So, um, so what we're doing as a follow-up to this, we're now collaborating with uh, a group in Glasgow who have got a large um, TMA of uh, 850 um, breast tumours from a range of different breast uh, subtypes and what they have done is they have carried out um, RNA scope to look at IL-6 message in this, in this cohort and they've also stained it for phosphorylation of STAT3 and also phosphorylation uh, and also um, markers of, uh, of cancer associated fibroblasts. Uh, so we're just looking at um, uh, we're just beginning to analyze that data at the moment to see whether there's any correlation and whether there's any uh, difference in the associations and the activation of these pathways in the IL-6, uh, in the sort of ILC tumors compared to the uh, IDC tumors. This uh, cohort, this TMA, they've also got clinical follow-up data, so we'll be able to then go back and correlate that with um, uh, whether it's involved in progression, etc. So that's that's work that um, is just ongoing at the moment. So, as I said, STAT3 is a, a, a um, is a transcription factor, and there's a number of genes that have shown to be potentially regulated by STAT3. So Esme carried out another experiment where she uh, took conditioned medium from, the, from one of her calf cell lines and she treated, um, this is the SUM44 cells, and looked and did an RNA-seq expression uh, analysis. And we can see here in the heat map that she identified 119 genes that were upregulated following um, stimulation of the, of, this, of the tumor cells with the calf conditioned medium. And when she did uh, gene ontology analysis of, of, of these samples, what she found was that uh, the top uh, hits were interferon gamma response and interferon alpha response. And this is consistent with the well-known uh, role of IL-6 in driving uh, immunomodulatory uh, effects within, the, within, within tumors. We also saw, uh, as we would have, uh, as we anticipated, an increase in IL-6 JAK STAT3 signaling uh, in, in, in the tumor cells. But we also saw interesting changes in uh, epithelial to mesenchymal transition, for example. Uh, things that we don't really understand the function of this yet, but things that um, we're, we think are interesting and we're going to be following up. So as part of this experiment, Esme also treat, had a, a group of uh, samples where she had treated with the anti-IL-6 uh, neutral anti neutralizing antibody to look at genes that were specifically um, IL-6 dependent, and this is this little group here. And we were interested in also addressing whether these were uh, directly linked to that IL-6 STAT3 signaling pathway. 
And so we started a few carrying out experiments on some of these genes. And where we, where in, these, in these experiments, what we've done is uh, we've treated the, the tumor cells with an siRNA to STAT3. And we can see here, this is the STAT3 expression. You get very nice uh, down regulation of STAT3 uh, with this siRNA compared to your control siRNA. And we can see here, this just also confirms this positive feedback loop of uh, IL-6 dependent regulation of STAT-3. So increased uh, treat with IL-6, large increase in expression of STAT-3, and you can block this with the, with the, um, with the IS uh, RNA to STAT-3. So what we did, we look, so we've just started to look at some of these genes in this IL-6 uh, dependent uh, signature that ESME has uh, identified. And we can see that some of these, such as mucin, serpent B5, are, are very nicely dependent on the expression of STAT3 in the tumor cells. And then other ones here, SR, uh, this S100A8, we can see that although it's reduced in the, in the SI, uh, uh, RNA, SI STAT3 RNA treated uh, tumor cells, there is still a large uh, expression of there, so there's a sort of partial dependence on, on, on um, STAT3. And the reason that we're interested in this is that we've been collaborating with a group in Turin, uh, Valeria, Valeria Poli, and they have, they have developed this SI STAT3 and they've actually now um, formulated this into a liposomal uh, formulation and they're about to start some clinical trials with this uh, in, in, in breast cancer. They're not, partic they're not specifically interested in uh, IL in, um, in lobular tumours, but Esme's spent the last four months over in her lab sort of working up some of these experiments and we're now sort of, I guess we're trying to understand whether actually in STAT3, uh, the STAT3 targeting might, might have a role in, in, in lobular tumours. Uh, but obviously we don't know what the functional role of this IL-6 STAT3 signaling access is in, in lobular tumours. I'm not going to show all the data, but Esme has shown that it's not linked to their proliferation or their stemness. She's got some evidence that it is driving a migration of the cells. And she's also been start, done some preliminary experiments looking at whether it's involved in their invasion and, and, and metastasis. What I haven't put on here is actually whether it's involved in regulation immune infiltration in, in, the, um, in the ILC tumours. Uh, that's obviously a, a major um, function of, of the IL-6 STAT3 signaling pathway. And we were just speaking to Julia yesterday about how actually her uh, genetically engineered mouse models would be a nice model to, to actually address some of these questions and whether this IL-6 STAT3 signaling pathway might be uh, involved in, in uh, immune cell recruitment. Um, and also just in response to some of the discussion after Sabine's talk, Esme's just carried out, uh, while she was in Turin, she's just carried out a proteomic analysis on the, on the factors that are secreted by the cancer-associated fibroblasts, and that'll give us a, 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 an idea of what other uh, immuno, immunomodulatory uh, cytokines are being produced by the, by the different CAF uh, populations that we have. So that's ongoing work and something obviously that's uh, going to be quite important in the future to try and understand whether this pathway is also infect, uh, affecting the immune uh, infiltrate. So, just wanted to put in one slide here because this is actually just we've heard a little we've heard over the last couple of days about how uh, estrogen uh, signaling is uh, uh, different in ILC and IDC and so I just wanted to put this in here we haven't done any follow up on this but this is when we looked at these uh, genes that were downregulated in response to treatment of the tumor cells with the calf condition region the main uh, gene set that came up was this uh, estrogen early early estrogen response genes and this is just showing that actually this is included the, in the uh, estrogen receptor itself uh, you can see here um, decreased expression when you treat with uh, conditioned medium and then you can see here with uh, restored uh, to, uh, when you treat with the anti-IL-6 uh, uh, antibody. So we, we haven't done any more follow-up but we are going to do a little bit of follow-up to try and understand using some of the data sets that people here um, have already generated looking at uh, gene signatures in uh, response to estrogen treatment and see whether there's any overlap with these gene signatures we've picked up uh, in response to um, IL-6 treatment. So that's something that um, 
uh, we're going to be starting in the next little while. So I just want to tell you about uh, a, a, another data set that we uh, generated. So this is uh, where we carried a laser capture micro dissection on some uh, ILC tumors. And um, what we did was we separated out the epithelial cells from the stromal cells. And this was done by Laura gomez Cudrado, who is a PhD student in the lab who's now finished. And what she did was when she did this uh, laser capture micro dissection, when she was uh, dissecting out the stroma, she was trying to get the extracellular matrix and a fibroblast component of that, and she was uh, without taking out the immune cells because we, we wanted to specifically look at the interactions between uh, what was happening to the, in the terms of the matrix and, and the cancer associated fibroblasts. So, when we did the uh, microarray analysis on this, we can see from the heat maps that she's uh, nicely separated out the epithelium from the stromal populations uh, from these, from these uh, ILC tumors. And then, when she did the gene and uh, ontology analysis uh, in the stromal genes, they were enriched for extracellular matrix, uh, degradation of the matrix, collagen degradation, etc., as you would expect. And then the genes that were enriched in the epithelial uh, um, compartment, these were, we had uh, genes involved in cell cycle, also rho GTPase effectors. So Laura was interested in um, finding out which genes were uh, specifically upregulated in the stromal, stroma of ILC tumors and not IDC tumors or normal tumors. So we've done this in collaboration with Morag Park and Nick Bertos at McGill uh, in, um, in Montreal because they had already generated laser capture micro dissection data sets for both IDC tumors and normal breast. So what Laura did was to look at her genes that were up in the tumor uh, the tumor stromal compartment to the tumor epithelial compartment in her ILC data set, and she filtered for ones that were uh, only uh, that were up only in her ILC and not in the data sets from the IDC and, and normal breast. And this, and then she sort of did further sort of uh, filtering of these genes. Uh, she looked at gene ontology analysis, genes that were involved in calf functions and extracellular matrix functions. She also filtered them for uh, genes that were uh, expressed in our, in our calf data set. And she also looked at, uh, she filtered them for ones that were overexpressed in, uh, in ILC compared to IDC in the TCG and Metabric uh, uh, databases. And she came up with this, with this um, list of, of nine genes that were uh, preferentially upregulated uh, or uh, uh, upregulated in the stroma of ILC. And so we then, to sort of try and understand whether this, what the relevance of these genes were, we sort of uh, looked at some survival analysis. So we actually combined this with some of the uh, CAF. Uh, genes that uh, Esme had identified in her RNA-seq data sets, and we can just see here that a group of them cluster in this network analysis, suggesting uh, some sort of functional, uh, functional relevance. You can see uh, there are actually some matrix metalloproteinases and, and their inhibitors here. Um, for example, there's also some integrins uh, and also some other integrins and matrix proteins. So, uh, so uh, Said. Hader and Rachel uh, Natchajan actually did the, um, they did the uh, survival analysis for us. And the majority of these genes, there was no difference in survival when we looked at in, the, in a number of different data sets. This is just showing for the Metabric. However, for TIMP2, uh, we, did see, um, we did see differences in survival. Um, and so TIMP2 is an inhibitor of, uh, of metalloproteinases. And so metalloproteinases are involved in degradation of extracellular matrix. And so they've been, in, uh, uh, they've been linked to um, increased invasion and, and metastases of, uh, of tumors. So we don't know what the relevance of this is uh, to ILC, uh, but it's something that's definitely uh, worth, worth following up because we have quite strong um, uh, uh, changes in survival with expression of, of TIMP2 in the ILC and not in the IDC tumors. So when we looked at, so the, the gene that was most uh, highly enriched in the stroma of, uh, of um, 
Laura's laser capture micro dissection data set was this protein called PAPI. Uh, uh, PAPI. So this is pregnancy associated plasma protein A, and this is just the, the data showing that it's uh, in, it's enriched in the stroma of the of the ILC tumours, but not the IDC or, or normal breast uh, data sets. So. What is PAPI? Well, it's a, a protein that's involved in IGF signaling. So it's a secreted um, uh, metalloproteinase, and it actually has a very specific uh, um, targets that it, 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 it uh, acts on to degrade. And these are IGF binding proteins. So these are proteins that bind to IGF. Uh, this, this is just shown for uh, IGF binding protein 4. So when PAPI is active, it actually breaks down the IGF binding protein and it means that it releases an active IGF 1, which is then uh, free to um, activate and signal, uh, activate signaling downstream. And so what the, the what What's proposed to happen in tumour cells is that this ha happens in the tumour microenvironment. So in, in cells, uh, it results in an increased bioavailability of IGF within the tumour compartment, and this could lead to increased signalling within tumours. So we've heard a lot about this pathway at this meeting. Um, this is just sort of showing the, the papers that we've already, that other people have talked about. So... Um, we did some work uh, with, with Patrick's group on this, showing that uh, ecotearin loss um, leads to um, increase in autocrine activation of growth factor signaling, including IGF signaling in lobular, in lobular uh, cancer. And also work from Steffi and Adrian showing that uh, showing some of the mechanistic sort of understanding of how this ecotearin loss can uh, lead to increased uh, uh, IGF receptor signaling in lobular tumours. And also this paper, which has been uh, highlighted today, that actually this can sensitise to uh, anti-IGF-1 in inhibitors. And so... So this is another component of, of this uh, of this IGF signaling pathway. So the question was whether actually PAPI, the levels of PAPI, is going to um, actually um, influence the amount of bioavailable IGF within the tumour microenvironment, and whether that can also lead to an upregulation of this IGF signaling pathway in, in, in lobular tumours. And and what's the other thing to note here is that actually there are groups developing, or there is a group that have developed an anti-PAPI antibody, and they've done some, uh, some preclinical uh, studies in mice to show that it has, has effects on, um, uh, on a number of different tumour models, including breast, but they've also done some work in, on, in ovarian uh, cancer as well. And so they're really trying to push PAPI as, a, as an alternative uh, uh, um, approach uh, to targeting this IGF uh, signaling path pathway uh, in tumours. So we wanted to understand a little bit more about what the PAPI was doing and especially what it was doing in the, in the lobular tumours. And so when Saeed did the survival analysis, what he actually found was that um, the, the, the um, high PAPI was actually associated with a worse, uh, worst um, survival. Uh, and this is just showing the data from the Metabric and Scan B data sets that he used. Uh, and, um, but there's no difference uh, in the IDC data sets. So what we do know is that uh, the levels, the expression levels of IGF-1, there's a very nice correlation with PAPI. Um, and we'd see that in ILC, but we don't see it in the IDC or normal tumours. So suggesting that, you know, there is a correlation between uh, IGF. We don't know whether this is bound or non-bound. Obviously, this is, just at the, this is just at the expression level. But when we looked at um, the... When we went to the TCAJ um, RPPA data set, where we could look at the matched... Um, tumours where we had PAPI expression and also um, levels of phospho IGF-1 receptor, which would be a readout of its activation state, we didn't see any correlation of, 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 the, um, of the activation of this pathway with PAPI expression. And so this begs the question of what, what is the PAPI expression actually telling us? It's not telling us anything about the activity. And so we've started to look at this 
in a wider cohort of, uh, of tumours. And so what do we know about PAPI? So we know that it's expressed in a subset of uh, ca cancer-associated fibroblasts. This is just so showing co-localisation with alpha-SMA. Um, but we also know from some um, RNA scope analysis that we've done that it's also expressed in tumour cells. So we know, uh, we can see here that there's transcripts in tumour and stroma, but it's just, there's a, a increased uh, a transcript in the stroma. This is just from a, a series of ILC tumours. And when we looked at, at this in a little bit more detail, in a wider um, number of breast cancer tumours, so this is just tumours across, across a, a range of different subtypes, what we actually found was that the PAPI expression was increased in, uh, in cadherin uh, negative tumours compared to cadherin positive tumours. And actually, if you break this down and look at the subtypes, the highest PAPI expression is in the cloud and low um, subtype. So we don't know what the relevance of that is, but uh, based on the sort of discussion about how cadherin is regulating uh, IGF and growth factor signaling pathways, you know, this uh, might be interesting in the con on context of that IGF signaling pathway. Also, when you break down the ILC subtypes into the immune proliferative and reactive, what we see um, is that uh, there's an increase uh, in expression in the is reactive um, subtype. So again, we don't know the functional relevance of this. Um, but what we're doing at the moment is we're using the same um, uh, TMA that we have with the colleagues in, in, in Glasgow and Xenaps uh, staining this with PAPE, and that'll be able to tell us. Uh, so this cohort, uh, the TMA is uh, 850 tumours across different subtypes, and we'll be able to look at uh, expression of PAPE in the, in the cancer associated fibroblasts, but also in the tumour cells themselves. And we're also... Um, Looking at, um, we're also looking at uh, phospho, uh, not, not phospho, the total IGF receptor in, in, the, in this cohort as well. But importantly, what we're also doing is we're looking at uh, levels of STC1 and STC2. So these are the stanio calcins, and these have been identified uh, by Klaus Oxvig to be um, important uh, endogenous regulators of PAPE. So they bind to PAPE and prevent it breaking down, uh, they basically inhibit its uh, protease activity. So if you've got high levels of SDC1 or SDC2 in your tumours, your PAPE is inactive. So we're hoping that by correlating the expression levels of this STC1 and STC2, that we'll be able to get a surrogate readout of whether actually uh, the high levels of PAPI are actually um, active within the tumours. We've also already shown in, in, the, in, the, in our ILC models that the, sec the secreted PAPI from the cancer-associated fibroblasts are actually active, is actually active and can um, lead to um, degradation of the IGF BP protein. So this is ongoing work and really I guess what we're trying to get at here is can we sort of understand um, whether, this, whether the PAPI or the IGF signaling pathway is important in lobular and what are the other and what would really be predictive, what, what information do we need to know that actually targeting this pathway, uh, you know, which tumours patients may benefit from this treatment, you know, can we sort of understand more about what's regulating this IGF signaling pathway in the ILC tumours and also in, in the other tumour types. So I'm going to stop there and just acknowledge uh, the people that have been involved in this. So Laura uh, gomez Cuadrado was a um, PhD student who started all this work. She's now finished, uh, graduated uh, a uh, couple of years ago, and this work's now been followed up by Zeynep uh, Mabruk, who's working on the PAPE story, and then I also showed you a lot of data from Esme, who's, who's, who's um, working on the IL-6 uh, STAT-3 uh, signaling pathways, I know uh, both of them have, are, are here. Uh, also, our collaborator, uh, Valeria Poli in Turin, who is um, uh, developing the SI uh, STAT-3 um, and we're working up, working up uh, that uh, with her. Uh, our collaborators in Glasgow who have the TMA, so as, as well as the um, large cohort that, that we're looking at at the moment, they've also just put together a cohort of around about 200 lobular, uh, lobular tumours with uh, follow-up data, and I'm sure Joanne would be very happy to um, collaborate with anybody that uh, is interested in, in looking at, at 
that, at that data set. Uh, uh, Morag and Nick in, in, um, in McGuill and Rachel and Saeed at the ICR for, the, uh, for carrying out all the survival analysis and Klaus and Fernil who were involved in the Papi, uh, Papi story. And finally, just thanks to all our uh, clinical collaborators in Edinburgh and also the patients who've, who've um, made it possible for us to access uh, the tumours um, to sort of carry out uh, a large number of these studies. Uh, so thank you. Thanks. I'm, I'm going to ask the first question because, well, because I can. Um, so my first question is, in terms of the, the IL-6 STAT-3 signalling and also actually when this pertains to your expression of, and the activity of PAPA, does it, does, is it the e coherent status of the tumour cells that's driving that signalling from the CAFs? Or is, it, or is it completely autonomous to the CAFs? In terms of so I suppose my, my, precise experiment, uh, my precise question was, when you did the, your SUM44 experiment, where you, you, you see that when you did the RPPA of the SUM44s and the presence of your CAFs, if you do that experiment now, just with an e and isogenic cell pair, do you see the same effects? No, no we, haven't, we haven't done those experiments, so yeah, we don't know, but yeah, it's, uh, that, yeah, that would be interesting to look at, especially in terms of the PAPI, where we're getting... All right, hello, my name is Neil Carlton. As uh, Dr. Desmet said, I work in the lab with Adrian and Steffi in Pittsburgh. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about uh, a new consortium we formed over the last couple of years called the Great Lakes Breast Cancer Consortium. Okay, so just to orient everyone, I think those, in the, those of us in the States are probably familiar with the Great Lakes, but many here probably won't be. Um, the Great Lakes are five large lakes and that really border the US and Canada. Um, we are right here in Pittsburgh, uh, and the collaborators on the consortium are Cleveland Clinic in Cleveland and the Ohio State University um, out in Columbus. So that forms the three institutions in the Great Lakes Breast Cancer Consortium, um, and I'll tell you a little bit about the collaboration between the institutions. So really the objectives are, of the collaboration were twofold. Um, so in the, in the US, I think a lot of you have heard of the SEER database and National Cancer Database. Um, while these databases are great uh, for many studies, they do lack a lot of granular details, and I think that was something we were trying to overcome um, in combining a lot of the patient data from our institution with the other two institutions. At our institution, at least, we've done a lot of single institution studies with our cancer registry, but we continually get the comment that having multi-institutional um, platform with uh, patients from different institutions is much more powerful. So really, that was the main goal of this uh, collaboration in the, in the Great Lakes Breast Cancer Consortium. So again, the main goal, uh, there's many analyses we can do with this, at least in the first round, uh, we wanted to compare some of the features, treatment, um, treatment trends, and outcomes between patients with ILC and IDC. Um, and again, this was from a large cohort of patients, um, and again, using the basis of the cancer registry data, but again, there was a lot of other data abstracted as well. Um, and really, this was to lay the groundwork um, to ask more specific questions now that the data is merged and integrated. So let me first talk about some of the data sources and study population. Um, so this is, again, a retrospective cohort study that included patients that were diagnosed between 1990 and 2017. Um, this mainly, we mainly started with the cancer registry data from each of these ins institutions. And while there are standards for cancer registry data, I will say that integrating and merging the data was much harder than I think we initially thought and took many, many years to complete. So that was not a trivial process in this case. Um, and additionally, we were also able to link some of the electronic health record data from these patients as well. Um, so not only do you have the standard patient and tumor characteristics from the cancer registry, but again, you also get some of the comorbidity data, um, lab data diagnosis, and some other variables as well. So again, overall, we had around 33,000 patients across all of these years um, with about 3,600 patients with ILC. Uh, and from each of the institutions, UPMC, which is our institution in Pittsburgh, contributed around 14,000 patients, Cleveland Clinic, another 12,000, and Ohio State, around 7,000. Uh, median follow-up time for the entire cohort was around 66 months, or five and a half years, um, and there was a range between one month and 345 months. 
And again, I think one of the challenges that's really been highlighted throughout the symposium is the challenge with um, diagnosing ILC. Not only is it sometimes variable across the three institutions, but it changes over time and changed really between 1990 and 2017. So an additional challenge that everyone here is well aware of. So, you know, a lot of the stuff here has been talked about a lot, so I'll sort of just briefly glaze over this data, but the patients in our cohort, um, patients that were diagnosed with ILC were older. Um, we did have some variability in the races um, with more black patients included that uh, had ductal carcinoma. Um, and in terms of the tumor characteristics, um, we had more patients with ILC diagnosed with later stages and more nodal involvement. So one of the things we did, uh, at least in the last couple months, was compare um, our, the Great Lakes cohort with those of the Metabrix, ScanB, TCGA, and Arpino and Chen, which were some of the other large cohorts that were published on a couple years ago. Um, so again, we had around 10.7% of patients with ILC in our cohort. Um, Metabrix a little bit lower. I think one of the interesting ones is ScanB, which really seems to have an enrichment of patients with ILC. But on, on the whole, our cohort was comparable to a lot of the other large published studies. So first, I'll highlight some of the treatment differences between ILC and IDC, and later I'll talk about some of the trends uh, that occurred from 1990 to 20, 2017. But first, just a static look at this. So patients with ILC generally receive um, more radi or, uh, less radiation therapy, um, more home hormone therapy, less, uh, less chemotherapy, but this difference was um, not significant, at least when comparing the ER positive cohort, um, and more mastectomy, again, which is in concordance with a lot of the other published studies. Um, and so again, we, most of the analyses in this, uh, in this cohort were first done in the entire cohort, which included um, HER2 positive and triple negative ILC, um, but, and then we did a separate analysis for the patients with ER positive disease. So again, in the whole cohort, uh, we see similar trends to what's been shown as well with uh, more late recurrences uh, in the disease, for disease-free survival in the patients with ILC, and again, this is reflected in the overall survival as well and a similar trend for patients with ER positive disease. And we show the five year, 10 year, 15 year, and 20 year comparisons between survival estimates between patients with ER positive IDC and ER positive ILC. So one of the advantages of having a large cohort was having the ability to an analyze some of the um, ILC subtypes. And again, even with over 3,600 um, patients with ILC, we still only had around 168 with HER2 positive disease and 29 with triple negative disease. And so even, with the, even though the numbers are small, ER positive um, ILC tends to have um, better DFS uh, with triple negative and HER2 um, having an inferior DFS. Again, although not significant, largely due to the sample size. If you compare uh, patients with HER2 positive IDC and ILC, no significant difference with respect to disease-free survival, and again, a similar story for the patients with triple negative ILC and IDC. So I won't, again, belabor this point, but we found a similar trend in the Great Lakes cohort as well between um, much few, many fewer patients of ILC um, being, um, ca being captured in the high-risk oncotype score we separated this out by ER positive, um, node negative and node positive as well, but um, yeah, further validation of this is certainly warranted, but again, similar trends in our cohort, cohort as well. And unique sites of metastasis for patients with ILC, I think one of the things that we did was restrict at least the graph on the right to patients that were diagnosed between 1990 and 2000 to see if there was any difference between those that had a longer follow-up time. But really, we saw the sites of distant metastasis were actually quite similar, even in those patients with an extended follow-up time. Um, and really, the one that, the site that stuck out the most in this analysis was um, increased percentage of metastasis to the peritoneum. And lastly, I'll just talk about some of the trends. Um, so, we see actually an increase in ILC diagnoses, ER positive ILC diagnoses starting around 2000 and continuing to around 2017. Um, and interestingly, we actually see an increase in the mean size uh, at diagnosis as well, uh, starting again around 2000. And this is a bit of a busy graph, but I think highlights the 
changes in, over time with respect to surgical management. Um, so I, patients with IDC are in blue and patients with I, ILC are in red. I, I'm not sure how well you can see that. <laughs> the dotted line includes patients that underwent mastectomy and the solid lines uh, represent patients that had breast conserving surgery. And so we see a general decline in um, mastectomy starting around 2005 or 2010. And I think this is actually in concordance with a new report out, I think just last week in JAMA Oncology that showed decreasing uh, rates of use of mastectomy and sort of this increase in lumpectomy. Still, for patients with ILC, there are still more mastectomies being performed. Um, as we refine sort of the patients that derive the most benefit from radiation frequency, or from radiation therapy, the frequency of radiation use, oops, also decrease over time, um, starting around the year 2000. Um, and at least for the ER positive cohort, lots of uh, hormone therapy approaching 90 to 100% and uh, decreasing use of chemotherapy over time as well. So as with any retrospective study, there are quite a few limitations, uh, especially with using cancer registry data, um, lack of standardization of ILC diagnosis across all institutions, and at least in the initial analysis, um, limited information on important ILC subtypes. And I think that's something we hope to enrich for as we move forward and perform some um, secondary analyses. And I think one of the things we've been trying to do in the lab is create sort of a graphical summary or a um, readily accessible, um, interpretable summary from the study. And so we actually included this in the submission as well. So this is a nice, uh, a nice wrap up from the study as well. So again, I think this shows that we've started this consortium, we've aggregated the data, and I think have a platform to really uh, make some meaningful conclusions in the future. So thank you. So yeah, I'm going to circle back to the cancer-associated fibroblast uh, in breast cancer and particularly in, uh, in lobular cancer. Uh, we use a lot of genetically engineered mouse models for this, uh, for this research and uh, I hope I can convince you that there's uh, different subtypes of fibroblast uh, that uh, differentially contribute to, uh, uh, to the formation of ILC. So first a little bit on uh, fibroblast. Uh, Val already gave a, a nice introduction. Um, of cancer-associated fibroblasts occur in pretty much any solid tumor, and they can affect pretty much all hallmarks of cancer. So they can increase metastasis, uh, they can increase the growth of tumor cells, and also avoid uh, immune detection. Um, but it's becoming increasingly clear that there's a lot of heterogeneity. So there's not one population of fibroblasts, but there's multiple uh, different subtypes of fibroblasts that can perform different functions within the tumor microenvironment. Uh, so there's tumor-promoting uh, cancer-associated fibroblasts and uh, uh, tumor-restraining fibroblasts. And uh, with the uh, emergence of single-cell RNA sequencing, this has become increasingly clear that uh, in different subtypes of, uh, of, of tumors, uh, and not only breast cancer, but also pancreatic cancer, uh, there's different subtypes of fibroblasts with distinct functions. And uh, equally uh, heterogeneous is uh, the hypothesis that have been postulated about the origin of these calves. Uh, so uh, there is uh, different data out there that show that uh, uh, bone marrow mesenchymal stem cells, for instance, can be recru recruited to developing tumors and then differentiate into uh, fibroblasts. But also uh, endothelial cells, parasites, and also EMT of actual tumor cells that can impose as fibroblasts in the tumor microenvironment uh, have been uh, shown um, uh, in various studies. Uh, but one of the culprit on most of these studies that it's been done mainly in in vitro models or co-injection models of tumor cells with fibroblasts. And just because you put two cell types together and one looks like a fibroblast doesn't mean that these cell types actually uh, uh, coexist uh, in vivo. Uh, so very little is known about the origin of calves during de novo tumor genesis in vivo. And uh, me being a postdoc in the lab of Jos Jonkers, who has generated many different mouse models of breast cancer, uh, was the perfect environment to, uh, to test this. Uh, so this uh, shows you a little bit uh, the heterogeneity of fibroblasts within the different uh, models of breast cancer that we have. So this is stained for PGGF receptor beta, so everything that's brown is a fibroblast. And I think you can appreciate that in these ILC models there's a lot of fibroblasts. Uh, sometimes up to half of the tumor is consistent of fibroblasts and not only of tumor cells. 
Uh, we also have models of triple negative breast cancer, uh, which have uh, far less fibroblasts in them, uh, usually about 5 to 10 percent. Uh, these tumors grow a lot uh, uh, more rapidly, uh, but the uh, stroma is border restricted. So uh, we can model these subtypes of breast cancer uh, in our lab using genetically engineered mouse models. So these are, uh, for the ILC, uh, we have memory gland specific loss of ecadherin and P10 or activation of the PI3 kinase pathway by overexpression of mutants. And triple neg negative breast cancer we can model by uh, a memory gland specific loss of BRCA and P53, either alone or in combination with MIC overexpression, which is a strong oncogenic driver and accelerates tumor formation. So using these four models, uh, I decided to tackle the uh, three main hypotheses of the origin of CAFs. So the epithelial to mesenchymal transition of tumor cells, so that's tumor cells imposing as fibroblasts, recruitment from bone marrow mesenchymal stem cells, or the hypothesis that tissue resident host fibroblasts uh, are the main contributor of uh, CAFs. So I set up uh, an array of different uh, transplantation studies to all uh, investigate these uh, hypotheses in vivo, and I will walk you through uh, each of them. So the first one is the MEC transplantation, which uh, René van Amerung already told you about uh, uh, yesterday, where we take uh, memory epithelial cells from, in this case, our uh, tumor models. So these are pre-neoplastic uh, um, uh, memory epithelial cells, so it's not existing tumor cells already. And we transplant them into the cleared fat pad of uh, a donor uh, or a recipient mouse. Uh, so if you do this at young age, the memory gland is not fully developed yet. Uh, you can uh, remove the endogenous gland and in the remaining fat pad you can place your, uh, your donor tissue, which then grows out into these transplanted glands. And if we do this for the four different models and we take a look at the fibroblast within these, uh, uh, these tumors, uh, because we do transplantations in uh, tomato positive uh, uh, donor mice, so these are red fluorescent, we can distinguish uh, whether the fibroblasts come from tumor cells which have no fluorescent tag or whether the fibroblasts come from uh, the host uh, in which they were transplanted in uh, because then they should express tomato. Uh, and as you can see in all of the four of these models, uh, we see that uh, nearly all of the fibroblasts are tomato positive, meaning that they come from the uh, uh, host that we transplanted the tissue into and not the um, uh, tumor cells that underwent uh, EMT. And this is consistent over different uh, analysis time points, so uh, early tumor genesis, advanced tumors, and end-stage tumors. So the second approach that we took was to see if bone marrow mesenchymal stem cells are uh, recruited and contribute to the pool of uh, cancer-associated fibroblasts in breast cancer. So for this particular approach, we uh, transplanted our uh, uh, tumor mouse uh, models with uh, tomato-positive uh, bone marrow. We left the mice to, uh, to settle for three weeks and uh, recover from this procedure. And then we did introductal injection to induce tumors. So thereby we're not making use of the wap cre that drives the uh, uh, recombination of our uh, mutant alleles, but we inject a lentivirus that expresses cre recombinase uh, into the memory gland of these, uh, these mice, uh, allowing the tumors to form after we did the bone marrow transplantation. And then again, analyzing the fibroblasts uh, within these four models at different time points, we see that nearly all of the fibroblasts are tomato negative, meaning that they do not come from the bone marrow. This was quite a surprise to us because there's papers in the polyoma middle T model, which is an aggressive uh, model of breast cancer, that there are actually uh, fibroblasts uh, coming from the bone marrow. So we also repeated the experiment in the opposite direction where we injected non-fluorescent bone marrow into fluorescent mice to account for the fact that maybe these mesenchymal stem cells have lost their expression, but we found the exact same results. Uh, so no recruitment of the bone marrow. Then the next uh, um, theory that we tested was that tissue resident memory fibroblasts actually contribute to the calf population in breast cancer. And for this we uh, did whole memory gland transplantation. So this is a little bit different from the MEC transplantation because you're not only uh, transplanting the memory epithelial cells but actually the entire memory gland. So basically you're giving these mice an additional memory gland. And uh, this is what it looks like, actually, uh, a drawing. So this um, technique was already described in the 60s in a paper. 
uh, uh, very detailed actually, and uh, we were able to use that to, uh, to set up these transplantations in the lab. And this is what it looks like in real life. So this is a mouse, so the head of the mouse is here and the tail is over here. This is the third mammary gland of the, of the mouse, so these are the endogenous glands. This is the fourth, and here you see the transplanted gland with a small tumor at its base. And when analyzing the fibroblasts from these different um, uh, tumors, again at different uh, time points, we found that the majority of fibroblasts were actually tomato negative, meaning that they come from the gland that we actually transplanted into these mice. Uh, there is a small population of uh, tomato positive fibroblasts, but we see those also in the mice that were transplanted with control tissue, meaning that this is probably a surgery induced effect and has nothing to do with tumor development. So uh, all of these data uh, culminated to the result that tissue resident fibroblasts actually uh, contribute to the, uh, uh, to the population of uh, fibroblasts in, in the tumors as well. So the next thing that we did was to perform single cell RNA sequencing uh, to see uh, over the course of tumor development to take a look at the heterogeneity and also how normal fibroblasts within the memory gland actually transition into calves. Uh, so we did this in the EKTM P10 model. So this is ILC uh, a model that we have used in the lab. Uh, so we have uh, different time points. So these are control mice uh, gated for the fibroblasts only. And then uh, at the over the course of tumor development. So what you can see is that uh, we see normal fibroblast populations decrease as we have less events uh, in the tumor setting and we see new populations uh, arising. And when zooming in onto these new, uh, newly arising populations, so the orange and the red uh, uh, clusters, and we do a G, um, uh, pathway analysis, we found that these uh, uh, red uh, fibroblasts are actually myofibroblastic uh, fibroblasts, so they express a lot of uh, collagens and extracellular matrix uh, uh, molecules. And the uh, orange uh, cluster is actually an immune modulatory uh, subpopulation of, uh, of calves. So they uh, express a lot of cytokines and things that modulate the immune system. So knowing that the uh, calves in, in ILC and in breast cancer come from these normal fibroblasts, we took a closer look at these normal fibroblasts. And we found that there are two populations of normal fibroblasts in the memory gland, which has also been shown uh, in, in, in human to be the case. And we could distinguish these two populations by their DPP4 or CD26 expression as we have a cluster of CD26 positive and negative fibroblasts. Uh, we were able to validate that on a protein level using whole mount analysis, but also on fax analysis. Uh, we see that there are CD26 positive and negative fibroblasts in the memory gland. And interestingly, in a normal unperturbed memory gland, uh, this ratio is about 50-50. But once tumors develop, you see that there's a disbalance between these CD26 positive and negative fibroblasts. So we get an increase of CD26 negative fibroblasts and a uh, a decrease in the CD26 positive fibroblasts, which is consistent with what we see when we take a look at these expression uh, over the course of tumor development. So the next thing that we did, we know that there's two subtypes of calves and there's two subtypes of normal fibroblasts. So how are those two linked? Can both of the subtypes of normal fibroblasts actually uh, form both subtypes of, of calves? Or is there a predispositioning between uh, these normal fibroblasts and the calves that they form? So in order to do that, we isolated CD26 positive and negative fibroblasts from uh, mouse memory glands, and we cultured them in the presence of either conditioned medium derived from tumor cells or in a uh, uh, matrix setup where we uh, stimulate them with, uh, with tumor cells themselves. And then we looked at these ICAF and MICAF gene signatures uh, um, over the course of this, uh, this experiment. So in the first panel, you can see where we did the experiment with the conditioned medium. Uh, this is plated on uh, uh, cells grown in 2D. And there we found that if we uh, plate uh, CD26 positive fibroblast in the absence or in the presence of tumor conditioned medium, that these uh, cells upregulate an ICAF uh, gene signature. Um, and, uh, but the MICAF signature was actually absent, uh, was not upregulated in, in either CD26 positive or negative cells, um, which could make sense because this is an experiment done on 2D, on plastic, there's no extracellular matrix to begin with, so that's why we repeated the experiment in these uh, collagen gels. 
So there the fibroblasts were plated in, in collagen gels, either alone or in combination with our tumor cells. And then we found that a MyCAF signature was upregulated in the CD26 negative fibroblast uh, uh, cultured with tumor cells, but not when they were cultured without tumor cells. But strangely enough here, our ICAF signature was gone again. So this kind of led to us thinking that the CD26 negative fibroblasts appear to become MyCAFs, uh, whereas the CD26 positive fibroblasts uh, appear to become ICAFs. Uh, but the induction of these phenotypes is highly uh, dependent on the culture conditions that we used, uh, which is known within the fibroblast field that these cells are very plastic and they can adopt different uh, um, uh, phenotypes depending on how you culture them. So we decided to go back to in vivo and see if we could uh, validate our findings in an in vivo situation. Uh, so we used in vivo lineage tracing of CD26 positive and negative fibroblast. Uh, we uh, wanted to use the uh, engrailed cream mice uh, because there's a paper out in 2015 by Yuval Rinkovich who showed that uh, uh, engrailed actually marks a specific lineage of fibroblasts in the skin. Uh, and that these fibroblasts are important in uh, scar tissue formation. So they cross these mice to an MTMG reporter, so you have a Cre expression under the control of engrailed, uh, which means that all of your cells will be, normally will be red, but uh, everything that expresses Cre will turn to green. Uh, and what they show in this paper is that all these engrailed positive fibroblasts in the skin also actually mark CD26, so I thought this would be a nice in vivo lineage tracing model for us to use. But unfortunately, as science doesn't always go <laughs> easy. Um, in the memory gland, the situation was not that clear. Uh, so, uh, and Grailed doesn't mark all of my CD26 positive fibroblasts. So instead of ending up with two populations, we ended up with four. Um, so this led us to uh, generate a CD26 Cree uh, MTMG mouse. Uh, but since that's gonna take a while, I decided to perform uh, transplantation experiments in these engrailed mice anyway. So uh, that's what we did. Uh, we used a little bit of a different setup because we don't know uh, during memory gland uh, formation uh, where these engrailed fibroblasts actually come from and how they uh, um, um, uh, contribute to uh, memory uh, uh, formation. So instead of uh, removing the endogenous gland, uh, we kept the endogenous gland intact and placed our donor tissue, so our uh, pre-neoplastic uh, uh, tissue from, the, from our mouse models, at the dorsal tip of this uh, memory gland. And what happens is that these two memory glands actually grow towards each other, uh, and when they meet, they stop uh, proliferating. And you can do this with control tissue or with a tissue that eventually develops into a tumor. So when we did this experiment with control tissue, we found that the distribution of our four populations of fibroblasts uh, remain similar. And unfortunately, you cannot see at this image, but uh, you will have to believe me, that the engrailed positive fibroblasts are lining both the endogenous gland and also the transplanted gland. So we transplanted tumors into these mice and uh, we, um, uh, or at least pre-neoplastic cells that develop into tumors. And then at the end stage, we isolated these four populations of, uh, of memory fibroblasts from control mice and mice that had uh, tumors. And we performed RNA sequencing on these four uh, sorted populations. And um, what we did is uh, a hierarchy uh, clustering to see uh, how these different four different populations differ from each other. And what we found is that the clustering actually didn't depend on engrailed status, but rather on CD26 expression. So uh, having CD26 positive or negative cells is what drives these different subtypes. Uh, and you can see that both of these fibroblasts actually respond differently uh, in the tumor microenvironment. So then again, we looked at our ICAF and MyCAF uh, signatures, and here I uh, uh, collectively called everything that's engrailed positive and double negative as CD26 negative, and this as CD26 positive. And then again, we found our ICAF signature to be uh, predominantly expressed uh, by the CD26 positive CAFs, and our MyCAF signature uh, to the CD26 negative CAFs. Confirming what we found in vitro with uh, the two different uh, setups. So next we did is to figure out what does it mean, a CD26 positive versus a negative fibroblast, how do they differentially contribute to tumor genesis. So we performed these organotypic invasion assays where you uh, have a gel uh, um, uh, of collagen 
Uh, and when you play tumor cells on top of these empty collagen gels, they just happily proliferate on the top, but they do not invade this matrix. But when we load these gels with either CD26 negative or positive fibroblasts, we see that these uh, tumor cells start invading the, uh, uh, the extracellular matrix. Um, and we can inhibit this uh, effect by using a uh, marimistat, which is a MMP uh, inhibitor. Uh, and knowing that the CD26 positive fibroblasts uh, uh, um, secrete an array of cytokines and have these immune modulatory effects, we decided to model this also uh, in vitro by using these uh, transwall assays where we uh, uh, put either fibroblasts alone, tumor cells alone, or the cell types together uh, at the bottom compartment. And at the top compartment, we put uh, splenocytes. So these are basically all of your immune cells, T cells, B cells, and monocytes. And looked at their recruitment towards uh, the bottom compartment. And we found that uh, specifically CD11B positive splenocytes, so these are your monocytes, are uh, enhanced uh, and or at least more recruited towards uh, tumor cells that have been uh, co-cultured together with CD26 positive fibroblasts and not so much with CD26 negative fibroblasts. And this uh, effect was CXCL12 mediated because a neutralizing antibody against CXCL12 was able to block this effect. So this brings me to my conclusions. Uh, I have shown you that nearly all calves in breast cancer, including ILC, uh, originate from uh, tissue resident fibroblast. Uh, normal, in the normal memory gland, we have two populations of, uh, of normal fibroblast that we can distinguish by their CD26 expression. Uh, the CD26 negative fibroblasts are predisposed to become my calves, uh, producing the extracellular matrix that we see in these tumors. And uh, the CD26 positive fibroblasts actually become I-calves, so these immune regulatory uh, um, uh, calves. And uh, we found that the CD26 positive fibroblasts seem to be at the origin of, of pro-tumorgenic I-calves uh, that can induce tumor cell invasion via MMPs, and they also recruit myeloid cells in a CXCL12-dependent manner. And with that, I would like to acknowledge uh, the people that have helped uh, this research. So everybody in the, in the Yonkers group and also our uh, uh, facilities at the NKI that have helped with the sequencing and the sorting. And um, of course, our funding agencies that made it possible to do this, uh, this research. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any of your questions. Um, and thanks for the organizers for um a great couple of days. It's been really interesting. Um, so my name's Elspeth Ward. Um, I'm a postdoctoral researcher in the Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland. And I'm going to talk to you today about BET inhibitors as a rational therapeutic target for lobular carcinoma. Maybe not? Oh. So 13% of um, women are diagnosed with breast cancer every year. And out of these, around 10 to 15% are lobular carcinoma. So as we've talked about before for the last couple of days, there is molecular characteristics such as loss of ecoderin, um, clinical characteristics, um, and treatment resistance is an emerging clinical problem. Um, previously, we've shown that um, in ILC patients, and expression, a high expression of a protein called BRD3 is associated with reduced disease-free survival. So BRD3, BRD3 is a met is a member of the Broma domain, an extra terminal motif family. Um, and these proteins bind to acetyl marks, um, which um, bind to acetyl marks, which, which alter transcription factors. But BAT inhibitors are, are therapeutics which, which downregulate BRD expression, and they do this by binding to the acetyl marks, blocking transcriptional regulation. Um, in the, within this paper, we we showed that a using the two ILC cell lines, the SUM 44s and the MM 134s, targeting these with with BAD inhibitors, and the BAD inhibitor that we used was JQ1, was capable of reducing proliferation and um, increasing apoptosis. And this was shown in silica and in 2D and 3D analysis. So within for my research, we wanted to move this forward into um, both in vivo and, and more rational BET inhibitors, which are, which are more clinically relevant currently. So we initially started off with a panel of nine BET inhibitors, um, and through in silico analysis, 2D and 3D analysis, we found that two BET inhibitors, specifically JQ1 and this BET inhibitor called MEV-BRESIP, have the highest potency in these ILC cell lines. 
um, and just a little profile of these selected drugs. Um, JQ1 was initially patented in 2006, so it's quite a much older drug. And Mevbrasip was developed by Abvi, um, and it was first it was first published in 2017. So the, the clinical characteristics between these is that it, JQ1 has poor um, pharmacokinetics, um, and it is not bi orally bioavailable. Um, it also has dose-limiting toxicities, and this is um, published in the literature, and it's also something that we see in our animal models, quite obviously. Whereas then uh, this AbbVie drug, which um, is orally bioavailable, also has a much lower toxicity profile, which we see in really obviously in our animal models as well. And one of the things that we can pin this to is the fact that the, cons or the dose of JQ1 m needs to be much higher to reach this, p this potent cell um, or this potent kill in the cells and in, in vivo. Um, whereas Mevbrasib is used at a much lower dose in, in, both, in both cell assays and in vivo. So the aims of this, this specific project was to look at the molecular changes that are caused by JQ1 and Mevbrasib, um, which is both the up and down regulated genes, the pathways associated with these, and the master regulators. And then finally, to look at if BET inhibitor inhibition is an effective therapeutic in vivo. So initially, we looked at the um, at RNA sequencing, and this, this was carried out by Anna Blumel. None of the bioinformatics is done by me. Um, and she, we initially looked at, oh sorry, the MM134s and the SUM44s, the kind of consistently the cell lines we use throughout the study. And we treated them with JQ1 as our kind of research drug and Mevbrasip as our new clinical drug and obviously vehicle. Um, and we initially found that obviously there's a massive dysregulation of genes. These are epigenetic readers, so they're going to have... Um, they're going to have a knock-on effect to thousands of genes after, after treatment. Um, of particular interest, though, is Mevbrasib, although at a lower concentration, or treatment is, is administered at a lower concentration, they have a much higher dysregulation of genes. Um, and then you, we also have these um, reverse effect genes, which, which are going maybe in different directions in different cell lines or different directions in the different drugs. But we also have these two groups of up and down regulated genes, which are both down, or sorry, I'll start with the up, 163 genes which are upregulated in both drugs, in both cell lines, um, in the red and the yellow. And then we have 156 genes down regulated in both drugs, in both cell lines. And these are kind of the two groups that we wanted to continue on with. Um, so the pathways then that are associated with both of these gene lists are kind of, or yeah, um, Initially, we, we looked at the more general pathways, which were more generic pathways, such as metabolic processes, and they kind of go both up and down, of course. That's kind of in keeping the role of, of these um, large gene data sets. But we also had um, pathways which were um, enriched or upregulated in all um, cell lines and all drugs, and downregulated in both cell lines and both drugs. Um, and the the pathways which were upregulated by BAT inhibition were, were pathway, two pathways which were positive regulation of ap apoptosis and negative regulation of growth. And then the, um, the pathways which were downregulated were pathways such as gene expression and, and DNA binding, which are kind of in keeping again with it, its role as an epigenetic reader. Um, so what we wanted then to do is to look at um, the master regulators that are enriched in this data set. So or, or RNA sequencing allows you to have this um, kind of final mRNA readout expression, um, which identifies a group of transcription factors. But we use this platform called GenExplain, which allows you to fill in the gap between um, uh, RNA sequencing and initial drug therapy. So what it does is it gets the transcription factor binding sites of all of your dysregulated genes from your RNA sequencing. You feed this through a network search in TransPath, um, and you can identify then this, these dysregulated genes or master regulators, and they're kind of the, the, first, um, the first thing to be dysregulated after treatment. So you're essentially um, filling in the gap between treatment and then RNA sequencing. Um, and what we did is we, we, we ended up finding 183 master regulators, which is a bit of a, a larger gene list than we wanted. 
Um, so we wanted to, f to filter these down. And one of the ways that we decided to filter this down was to, to factor them off between down-regulated and up-regulated master regulators, um, which, are, which is shown here. So this is the down-regulated genes, uh, or the down-regulated master regulators. Um, and one of the master regulators here that I'm going to talk to, talk to you about is, is SUV39H1, which is a histone metal transferase. Um, and the reason we find this kind of interesting in the down-regulated um, gene list is that there's this paper that says knockdown of SUV39H1 restored ecoderin expression um, um, and resulted in the in inhibition of cell migration invasion metastasis. Um, and of course, this is interesting for lobular carcinoma because a subset of these are um, down-regulated by promoter hypermethylation. Um, and what we do see, though not significant, is after bat, bat treatment, there is an upregulation of CDH1. Um, we then also wanted to look at the upregulated gene list, um, and of interest, I, this was talked about yesterday, but of interest for us was this FGF43 and then another oncogenic, um, an oncogenic master regulator called H, HSPA1. Um, and Previously in our, in our publication, the FGF4 family was, was highlighted, so it's kind of that proof of concept that this, this system of analyzing the data is also bringing up these other um, genes that were previously found through different methods. Um, and the FGF4s can be targeted with clinically relevant uh, therapeutics now, such as erdofitinib, which we then looked at 3D assay by, by bin bin here. And um, the, the merge between bad in inhibitors and this FGF4 inhibitor completely related cell growth. Um, so it kind of moves a bit more towards this personalized therapy that you can combine these bad inhibitors with novel therapeutics or, or a secondary therapeutic to get a, a complete um, ablation of cells. And, the, and will, the combination therapies will allow us to use a, a lower dose of the bad inhibitors having less toxic effects. Um, so then finally, I wanted to look at bad inhibitors as an effective treatment strategy. Um, and at the time that we were putting in this application, the mammary introductal implantation method was being, was being published on by George, which is what we used for, for this study. Um, so we injected the SUM44s, the MO134s, um, waited to the treatment start point, treated these for 21 days. So this specifically was JQ1 and it was um, by IP. And then we tracked this by IBIS imaging. And what we found is that the treatment with JQ1, which was our research um, BET inhibitor, reduced the, the primary tumor growth um, in both the SUM44s and the MO134s. Um, it, they had a small effect on metastasis, but the studies were just a little bit shorter than, um, than was necessary, or what George had previously shown up to nine and, and 12 months for, for metastatic analysis. We then wanted to look at if JQ1 can work um, with anti-endocrine therapy. So we've shown that um, the BET inhibitors can work synergistically with all um, types of anti-endocrine therapy. And um, we, we, we want to move to this into, into the, an in, in vivo model. So again, we use the MO134s, the SUM44s are, are yet to be completed. Treatment start point, 21 days, and the, then JQ1 was added with two fulvestrant and tamoxifen, and these were tracked by IBIS imaging. So initially we found that uh, treatment with fulvestrant actually flat lines. So the, the red line, I hope you can see that, the red line is vehicle treatment group, and the blue line is fulvestrant. And this is kind of what we see in these cell lines in, in 2D culture as well. It's, it's more of a stop sign than it is a kill sign um, treatment or fulvestrant treatment. And JQ1 really has, has no effect in, in, in this model. But then when you add tamoxifen, so, so the MO134s are quite resistant to tamoxifen, which you see um, tamoxifen is again the blue line, which, um, sorry, yeah, is the sorry, the grey line, sorry, which has grown to the same, um, kind of the same path as, as vehicle treatment, so they are very resistant, but the addition of the BET inhibitor, JQ1, works synergistically to reduce this, this tumour burden, this primary tumour burden in these cells. So just to conclude, um, BET inhibitors, JQ1 and Mivrasip have highly similar effects in both the ILC cell lines. The pathways that we've seen are what we would predict the, um, 
or what would be expected from epigenetic readers in these cells. Um, and harnessing this master regulator analysis can allow for discovery for combination dr drug therapies. And JQ1 can effectively work synergistically um, with tamoxifen um, in reducing primary tumor growth. And I just want to thank my lab and my mentor, Darren O'Connor, um, and Anna Blumel, who works very closely with me on this work. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, Elspeth. Uh, do you, are there any questions?